Awesome. Right, we're cooking with gas. Okay, hello. Um, this is a, a bit of an introduction to leveraging rapid development with platform as a service on Cisco Cloud. Um, I'm going to kind of give an overview of some of the platform as a service tools we're using internally, um, some of the options in the market, and just kind of give a, a general overview of kind of where you are best getting started with PASS today to accelerate your uh, development. So this is the agenda. Um, we'll do a Q&A session at the end, which isn't on here, but we're going to do cover kind of pass versus containers. Are they the same thing? Um, how are they different? We're going to then look at the benefits of pass over not using pass for your software deployments. Um, look at the current solutions and products in the marketplace. Um, look at how those get deployed onto CCS currently and very soon in the future with a little bit of a roadmap spoiler. Um, we'll then cover continuous integration and how you can kind of leverage PaaS to do rapid development and rapid production deployments. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some things to watch out for that we've experienced when we kind of took the move to platform as a service. Um, and then we'll kind of cover briefly Cisco's roadmap and, and do a bit of a Q&A. Sound good? Awesome. OK, so my name is Matt Johnson. I come from a very heavily operations networking and automation background. I've had the privilege to work with some really good developers who have kind of, you know, given me that side of their view and, uh, and kind of, you know, made me realize that ops aren't right, dev aren't right. You could say I'm kind of a, a bit of an unholy DevOps person now, if you want to put it that way. But I work for the Cisco Cloud CTO office, um, and I've been involved with the past community for about three years. Um, so I regularly speak at Cloud Foundry summits, and the I'm based in London, so I speak at the kind of London Cloud Foundry platform user groups and the London Pass user groups as well. And I'm on Twitter as uh, Matt J for any comments, feedback, hate mail, you name it. So just for the context of this talk, um, I want to cover. For those of you really new to Platform as a Service, um, I want to cover what Platform as a Service is. Um, you get the kind of questions a lot of the time like, oh, but I'm running Docker, right? Docker's a pass. Um, so I just kind of want to address, for the context of this talk, what we're classing as Platform as a Service. Now, you can take NIST's official uh, industry definition, which is that big blob of text there, but that still doesn't really tell you much about what you can actually do with it, what the benefits are. Um, you could pretty much translate that to anything you were really trying to say. So let's actually cover kind of what PASS is and what the benefits that I see for PASS versus other deployment tools. So there's a responsibility shift, right, from kind of when we used to do everything on-prem, um, up through infrastructure as a service, VMs, and now into kind of PASS and containers, and then, we, you know, We've always had kind of software as a service on the other side. Anything in white is what your development team or your product team has to take responsibility for. So obviously on-prem, you have to do everything from teams to deploy your data centers, WAN, LAN, connectivity, compute, virtualization. And then when you consume infrastructure as a service, you know, those bottom red boxes, you are saying, look, you guys deal with those. Um, I'm not interested. I want you to give me VMs that I can put my OSs on and then I'll take responsibility for everything else above it. Pass, as you can see, pretty much deals with everything apart from your application. Um, and that's really the key differentiator between Pass and Docker. If you actually look at what Docker is giving you, it's virtualizing your kernel layer, but it still needs a user space that you build, right? You can't just push code into a blank Docker container and expect it to run you're going to need middleware, you're going to need a runtime, you're going to need frameworks. And yep, Docker makes that really easy because you can use Docker images from the web. But in terms of actually what you need in that Docker container to run, um, it's not just your application code. Whereas with Pass, it is. It's, um, it's providing as a service and built into the framework a lot more of the layers you actually need to get to a running application. So this is just kind of backing that up. You know, it's, the pass is all about the user experience, the ease of use to get an application running. Um, 
if we actually look at an architecture diagram for a Cloud Foundry, which will be focusing on an OpenShift on the uh, Cloud Foundry on the left, OpenShift on the right, you see the areas in the red boxes um, are the only actual areas where containers are involved. You know, the rest of it is adding value to the user. It's, it's making the user able to do things that with containers alone, they can't. It's doing scheduling, orchestration. Um, it's providing you a way of like draining all your logs out to give developers easy access to them. Um, you know, containers are a part of the puzzle, um, but they are not the whole story. So let's look at past value um, that we've seen from kind of the past journey we've taken within Cisco. Um, we have numerous product teams and cloud products in production running on one form of platform as a service or another. Um, and through enabling that journey for them, you know, we've, we've kind of seen the return on investment and the value that um, deploying your software in this way brings. And I didn't know there was animation on this slide. So for a developer, right? I'm developing however I currently develop. Why should I care about moving to a, a fully blown platform as a service? Well, you get a lot of features for free. Um, it reduces your per product load, you know? You don't have to think about, well, you know, what tooling am I gonna cobble together to do um, automated deployments and scaling? Um, how am I going to define an infrastructure to get my logs out to the developers where they need them once this uh, application's in production? Um, how am I going to do load balancing and high availability? You know, what do I need to install load balancers? Do I need to like understand that kind of technology? Um, all of these things a parse should provide to allow the developer, as we saw on those boxes, to just concentrate on their application. Zero downtime upgrades, again, like how do, I, how do I rev my code without worrying about the process and about coding that process wrong or hacking something together wrong and taking the wrong thing out of load balances, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and also portability, and I want to just kind of give a personal opinion on this. I really like Pass as a portability layer. And it's actually one reason that when people say to me, oh, isn't it cool that um, OpenStack is getting all these kind of new projects in the community to do more and more platform as a service style work. I don't actually agree that that's a good thing. I quite like that absolute definition between the thing providing a really good infrastructure as a service and then my platform as a service APIs on top of that. I don't want my platform as a service APIs becoming so intertwined with the OpenStack community that I no longer have portability to AWS, Azure, you know, um, non-OpenStack type deployments. Um, and so that's why, obviously, the projects aren't ready yet in the, uh, in the OpenStack community anyway. Uh, but that's why we're mainly focusing on non-bundled pass in this talk. We're talking about Cloud Foundry, and we're talking about OpenShift. Again, focusing on developing software, it enforces scalable coding practices. Now, I know that sounds a bit harsh. You know, I'm meant to be saying, oh, let the developer do whatever they want, let them focus on their code, and now I'm kind of saying, actually, we've kind of enforced some things on them. But there's some stuff you cannot do as a developer in a, um, in a platform as a service type environment. For example, you can't just go, ah, crap, that deployment isn't running because I need to SSH onto that box and install this RPM or install this dependency or tweak this configuration file. Um, you know, each instance of an application you host on platform as a service is ephemeral. You shouldn't care if it dies and three more come up to take its place. Um, and because of that, there is no real, oh, I can SSH to this and it will be there forever. There's no um, you know, treating your application like pets rather than cattle. You know, yes, you can go in and manually edit something, but the chances are you know, if Jenkins runs or if CI CD kicks off or even if like you have an issue with that container that the past decides it wants to rip it down and spin up a new one to take its place, your changes are going to go. And so it does kind of enforce you to, um, it enforces you to write your code in a way that there's no, you know, you're not going to be tweaking it on production. There's no, oh, it's fully automated, but we just need to log in and do this one thing before we can kick over to the, the backup data center or anything like that. It either works when you deploy it, or you have to tweak something in your deployment bundle, or tweak something in your code, or tweak something in your manifest so that the pass will actually start that 
instance of properly. And all of this comes down to a faster time to production, right? All of these things that your DevOps team is now not worrying about, they're not going, oh, we need to create a snowflake, we need to install routing, load balancing, you know, how are we, we need, we need an elk cluster, where are we gonna get that from, you know? All of these things a pass should provide so that you can get started quickly and get your actual business value code written, deployed, tested quickly. So let's think about the operator now. Now, everyone says we're meant to have DevOps teams. You know, everyone says Dev and Ops work beautifully together in harmony. Um, hands up if that's true in your company. Hands up if your operations guys and your dev guys are on the same team day in, day out, and helping each other with each other's problems. Yeah, exactly. It's a really nice idea, but in practice, it's probably not the case. Um, we're getting there, you know, the industry's changing, the mindsets of the dev team and the ops teams are changing, um, and it is really cool to see what happens when you have passionate devs and passionate ops people actually working together from the start of a project, but in case we're not quite there. Um, for the operator, they're suddenly running one platform. They're not running some Tomcat installations over there for that team and something on AWS over there for that team and you know, Red Hat for them and CentOS for them. And even if you're supporting multiple developer environments, you're suddenly running one set of code which is loosely coupled, which you can understand what the components do and how to check whether they're online, and more importantly, that's designed to scale. And that's really important. It also gives you repeat, because you only have that one set of components, it means that you can really repeatedly and easily orchestrate those. So actually installing the pass, the ops team installing the pass into OpenStack or AWS or vSphere or you know, onto someone's laptop or whatever it may be, um, it's gonna be one code train they need to worry about. It's gonna be one product that they need to understand really, really well. And it gives environment consistency. You know, if I deploy the pass over there and the pass over there, the developers cannot say, oh, but you know, this VM is different. This, like, the actual layer that is exposed to the developers, that usual back and forth between is it ops or is it dev, you know, in, in the situation where they're not all in harmony, that kind of goes away. It's, there's a very clear demarcation at the platform and the code level. So ops has the platform, the platform is testable, the platform provides an API to the pass that the developers can use for their code. It's very, very clear to see whether something is broken because the platform has failed or whether something has broken because the code isn't working correctly or the container isn't spinning up correctly. And that's something that the development team can easily see because they have those log services by default. They can get into it, they can work out what's going on. And there's just a lot more self-service for both teams. There's just a lot more, we can solve this problem ourselves without having to wait or you know, ask someone else to get involved or kind of that whole across the fence thing that happens. And it gives power to the development teams. The idea that you can use an API from a coffee shop to safely get a live stream of logs from 100 instances of a production application across the world without having to need SSH access or without having to have the operations team stand up some custom out cluster and give you all the granularity and security setup of that. The fact that you as a developer can see production code running, see the logs, work out what's going on, see metrics from it, just as a value out of the platform without you know, having to go across those teams is massively beneficial. I remember when I was working kind of backline operations for um, Cisco Cloud Web Security back in the day. Like the amount of time that was taken up kind of, we had about seven and a half thousand servers originally before virtualization in 22 data centers. And the amount of time that senior engineers spent just surfacing logs for developers or looking for logs for developers or you know a developer saying well I can't see I don't have visibility into all of this stuff and you're kind of providing some of this for me and there's no clear demarcation point um, so I need you to go and actually verify that all your stuff's okay because I think this isn't a code problem 
Now, obviously, I'm coming at this from an operations point of view. I completely get for developers that ops people can be a pain in the ass as well. But you know, just those back and forths, and it's, it's really hard when those teams aren't working in harmony. Um, it's really hard to say categorically, unless you have this kind of demarcation and this kind of self-service, this isn't our problem. You can, you, know, you can solve this yourself. Honestly, like talking to us about this isn't going to help your production app run any quicker. So because the operator has a reduction in bottleneck, again, it's faster time for, to development from the development side and from the operation side. Which means there's advantages for the business. It's faster innovation, the whole fast IT that you've heard numerous times, I'm sure, this week already. Um, there's growing expectations from developers that the business, you know, a software business, will provide them the tools to quickly do their job uh, and not in a very archaic old way where they're going around the houses. Um, the industry wants more than infrastructure as a service. From service, uh, from service providers. Developers are kind of expecting this development platform more and more. You know, it's, it's what new and upcoming developers up through university and schools are, are learning on. It's what they're expecting the platform to look like when they start developing production code. Um, and so there's a business advantage there of new markets. You know, for service providers, um, for anyone running kind of IaaS, you probably already have past demand and you might not know about it. And at the end of the day, it's about giving customers what they want and to spend less time giving them that, you know, what they want. So as I said, we're focusing on two main products. Um, the kind of Cisco pass strategy, just to let you know, is not to say we as Cisco want you to use this pass. Um, there's lots of products in the market. There's kind of two that stand out, as I said, OpenShift and Cloud Foundry at the moment. Um, Cisco, as we move through our roadmap, which I'll cover later, are happy you know, supporting both. We appreciate that choosing one over the other and Cisco dictating one over the other is going to alienate half of our audience. So there's, there's value to both, and we're going to cover both. So just for those of you that don't know, uh, your current options, your current, you know, you walk into the past store, what are you going to buy? Um, there's kind of two options. There's Cloud Foundry and there's OpenShift, both as kind of commercial supported, all, you know, all in one platform as a service products. Cloud Foundry was spun out from VMware. It's backed by VMware, GE, and EMC as a joint venture. There are open source and commercial versions. Um, it's one differenti differentiating feature really from OpenShift at this, le at this level is they have a data service broker model. And what I mean is, the, the Cloud Foundry pass is for application code. There's nice integration through these broker APIs for dynamically provisioning data services to pass into your application at deploy time, but the actual data services are not running in the pass itself. Um, the commercial version has automation to deploy some common um, data services, kind of your, your big data companies, your Cassandras, your uh, Memcaches, your Redis, alongside Pass. Um, but they're not, um, they're not actually running in the Pass compute resource. Cloud Foundry has a really large community. It's a really good community. Um, they're, they're pretty technical, and they're pretty happy to help people wanting to get started. Um, and they have an internal scheduler called Diego. And we'll get onto schedulers a little later, but the scheduler is basically the thing that when you ask a pass to spin up five copies of your application code, and under the hood it's creating containers, the scheduler is choosing where to place those containers across however much compute resource you've given the platform as a service. OpenShift by Red Hat. It's built on Red Hat's solid reputation. Um, again, there are open source and commercially supported versions. Um, one thing to note here is OpenShift v3, which is coming out, well, it should be out now. It's, I, I think it's either in late beta or just about released, um, is a complete redesign from OpenShift version 2. Um, however, there is one main comparison. OpenShift still treats data services like code. So in OpenShift, your data services are generally running in that same platform compared to Cloud Foundry where they're running at the side. 
that has different, you know, that has some usability benefits because your data services are already there, but it might mean it's harder to integrate um, with kind of data services you already have in the business um, using Cloud Foundry's data services broker model. It all depends on kind of your use cases, and I would recommend you kind of look into both of these solutions if you're looking down the pass route. So OpenShift v3 has basically taken Google's work on Kubernetes, which is a container scheduler, um, and has built a user experience layer on top of Kubernetes. So all those extras that I said differentiate Docker from a pass, all those things you get for free, all those user experience things allowing developers to focus on their code. Um, OpenShift v3 has taken an existing scheduler instead of Cloud Foundry, which has written Diego themselves and is then developing that value-add user experience on top of an existing scheduler. So I just wanted to cover Mesos here as well, just because this is kind of a getting into, into pass, what is pass kind of talk. And a lot of you will hear about Mesos. There's quite a lot of media buzz about it. You'll, you'll hear press releases, things like that. Mesos is not a pass. The best way to describe Mesos is a scheduler. Mesos will schedule bits of compute resource via an API across a pool of compute resources. So technically, if you could be bothered doing all the integration work and muddling through the politics, um, you could use Mesos instead of Diego or instead of Kubernetes underneath the Cloud Foundry and OpenShift passes to provide the Cloud Foundry and OpenShift developer experiences, but just using a different scheduler for where the actual containers with your eventual applications are running. Um, so it's not a pass, it's a scheduler, but I'm just mentioning it there in case people are like, what is the difference? Technically, you could run Cloud Foundry and OpenShift user experiences on Mesos. I mean, it's possible, just like kind of building a space elevator to the moon is possible. Um, Mesos is gaining traction, but don't think that that means you're going to be able to, if you have developers already using Cloud Foundry or OpenShift, you're not going to be able to say, oh, you can have your same experiences next week, and yet the entire data center has Mesos installed. So again, Mesos isn't a pass. Um, with Mesos, you are basically saying, I want five copies of this Docker container to run somewhere on one of my compute nodes. It is not going to give you um, multi-user granularity. It is not going to give you, I have two, three development teams, and they all need to stay separate and not see each other's workloads or destroy each other's workloads. Um, it's not going to give you, when I'm running those five instances, I want there to already be a system in place to collect all the logs from those instances and give them to, to the developer in real time over an API. Um, it's really the, yeah, the, those things that you're missing are the kind of value out of a pass compared to just running a scheduler and Docker containers. Will these kind of um, user experiences be built on top of Mesos? Probably. Um, are they there yet? No, if that helps. So just to kind of confirm these two differences, let's look at a, a kind of simple application topology for Cloud Foundry. We have the developer down here in blue. He talks to the API and says, I want to spin up two instances of app one and one instance of app two. And then the scheduler, Diego, is going to take the user's code, either from source control or from him passing his build to the API, like this is the code I want you to run, uh, which usually has like a manifest in the source to actually tell the pass, this is Java, you need to install me these frameworks in the container, blah, blah, blah. Um, and it's going to use the scheduler to spin up two containers and put a copy of application one in each of them and one instance of application two. Now, when the user talked to the API, he said actually, or in the manifest, he said actually, application one needs a database. It needs some SQL or something like that. So it also called the service broker API, which dynamically provisioned a, date, a portion of a database somewhere else. The operations team that runs this pass 
has already configured multiple services within the service broker and said, if the developer wants access to SQL, you go here, you run these commands to provision a username and password, a new database, and then the service broker provides a way of passing that data up into each instance of the application at runtime. But the data is stored outside the pass. So these two applications can now both access this same database. They're both given the same credentials, same username and password to actually get to this sh stored, shared data. Um, and application two has, you know, there was nothing specified about extra databases or extra services at boot time. So this has no access to that, purely because it doesn't know the credentials, the URL, everything that the service broker told these app instances about when they booted. The user who wants to get to these applications, these applications are given a DNS name. Um, multiple instances are load balanced by the Cloud Foundry routing layer. So all this user does is hits the Cloud Foundry routing layer at that DNS name, and they will get one of the currently online operational instances um, of that application. Compare that to OpenShift. Looks a lot simpler because there's no external database and there's no service broker to connect to those external databases. What we basically have is two copies of the application, again deployed through the Kubernetes API this time, or the uh, OpenShift API, which uses the Kubernetes scheduler. Um, and what's basically happened is a separate application has been spun up, and that application just happens to be a database. It happens to be an instance of MySQL or Redis or Mongo or whatever your database requirements are inside of a container. And then because every application effectively has a DNS name or a, a route to that application, the code application can get to the data um, through the proxy node internally. And the user coming in uses that same proxy service to be directed to one of the two running instances of the application. Now, you can see there there's quite a difference in when you're deploying your pass, right? Do you have existing data services? Do you think that this is going to scale? Do you, want your, do you want your database bound IOPS to be running on the same nodes as your code? Or would you rather have them separate? So it's a, it's a design choice, but it's one that we can't, you know, you guys need to make by looking at how the two passes do things slightly differently. And I can't really just talk about OpenShift or Cloud Foundry either on this uh, journey into Pass. There is a community around kind of both, you know, both thought streams, either your, your Cloud Foundry or your OpenShift. Um, on the Cloud Foundry side, Active State, the company, has a product called Staccato. This is based on open source Cloud Foundry. It is API compatible with Cloud Foundry because it is Cloud Foundry. They've just prioritized some different things in how they deploy a Cloud Foundry pass. They've bundled some automation to deploy data services by the side of the pass for you and set up those service broker configurations for you so that you have at least you know, developer scale data services out of the box. Um, Kubernetes, again, on the other hand, it, OpenShift relies on it. Kubernetes is not a pass. It doesn't provide all those added extras of the OpenShift user experience. Um, it's a scheduler. But again, just so you know where all of these pieces of the puzzle fit um, if you start reading up on kind of the pass landscape at the moment. So we've decided on the pass we want. We definitely want the pass for all those benefits I've just discussed. How are we going to deploy onto Cisco InterCloud Services? So for anyone that doesn't know, um, for anyone that missed the announcement, for anyone that hasn't had it rammed down their face this week, um, Cisco InterCloud Services is a highly scalable enterprise class OpenStack based cloud. It's built on Cisco's best of breed infrastructure and software defined networking technologies for you to host your applications. Uh, for more information, developer.cisco.com forward slash cloud. That provides, if you wanted, an IaaS, right? It's OpenStack. You can spin up VMs on Cisco's cloud. But another part of the InterCloud strategy is the Cisco Marketplace. This is a set of pre-vetted partner applications tested and pre-configured to run on Cisco's cloud 
that you can search, select, and use the automation built into Marketplace to deploy directly to Cisco Cloud. So for example, Active State, the Cloud Foundry, the open source Cloud Foundry product, um, they have a kind of single VM dev instance that spins up an entire Cloud Foundry pass, a working pass, you can host code on it, you can spin up data services in it, as I said, because Active State have prioritized some of that work. Um, that is in the Cisco Cloud Marketplace at launch, um, and see developer.cisco.com slash cloud for the actual launch dates. So the idea being that you'll be able to go to the Cisco Marketplace, you'll be able to go, right, I need a Cloud Foundry compatible pass right now in Texas or in Amsterdam or in any of the Cisco uh, InterCloud services data centers. I want that deployed right now. That will deploy, and instead of just being given a VM that you have to configure, the marketplace will automate that process, and you will just be given, right, your Cloud Foundry, your Staccato Cloud Foundry cloud is now up and running. Here's the API URL. Here's your, de um, your initial username and password to log on, and you're ready to go. Um, it's not just pass on here. There's data services. There's Cisco products themselves, like CSRs and things like that. But Marketplace is a one-stop shop for deploying known working configurations of partner applications and Cisco products. So that's one way you could very easily deploy a pass to get started. So just to cover that, current deployment options. Deploy from Marketplace. And I have a star against that, because Marketplace is not actually released yet. Um, it's coming very, very soon, but watch out for the announcement. I just wanted to let you know it's, it's there and it's coming and show you a sneak peek of the screenshot. Um, you could deploy to any infrastructure as a service, including Cisco InterCloud services, using your own automation. You know, at the end of the day, a pass is just built up of components. You have a message bus, you have a scheduler, you have the, the piece of code that runs the API. Um, both of these passes have open source versions, so you could take that, you could automate those onto your own infrastructure as a service, however you automate everything else, be it Puppet, Chef, Ansible, Terraform, et cetera, et cetera. You could deploy using out-of-the-box um, automation, as is often common with kind of open source products. If you buy the enterprise version, installing the damn thing is a lot easier. Um, so if you buy Cloud Foundry from Pivotal, the uh, corp the, the paid-for version of Cloud Foundry is called PCF, Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Um, if you buy that, it comes with something called Ops Manager, which automates the deployment, scale, monitoring, and day-to-day -day operations of the Cloud Foundry pass. Um, I believe there is something similar for um, OpenShift v3, but I'm not sure on that, so don't quote me. Alternatively, you could deploy via a vendor relationship or a services engagement. Um, you know, both of these companies have, um, both of these companies have um, professional services outfits. Red Hat certainly does. It's, it's most of their business model. If you wanted people to come in and have a large deployment with certain use cases, integrate with existing data services, et cetera, obviously those kind of companies would be more than happy to help you move forward with this. And so this little roadmap teaser, this is what's coming very short term. Um, we are going to release our own open source Cisco tooling for deploying Cloud Foundry and OpenShift, mainly because we are using it ourselves and we need to deploy our own passes. It doesn't make sense for that to be internal because it's just some automation code. Um, so on GitHub slash Cisco Cloud, we'll be deploying Cloud Foundry and OpenShift automation for actually getting those running on top of OpenStack. Alternatively, don't deploy at all consume pass from Cisco InterCloud services. Just as you can currently spin up VMs on Cisco InterCloud services, we're also planning on providing a couple of different hosted, managed, scaled, updated passes as a service for you guys to use if you don't want the hassle of deploying, managing, and learning all the internals of these stacks yourself. With the advantage that they'll be integrated with CIS existing data services, They'll be integrated with Assurance, Analytics, Cisco Security Everywhere, IDS, IPS. Um, and as I said, it's a, it's a managed service that we're going to be providing soon. So watch out for that. So now we've got our pass deployed. We've chosen a pass. We've deployed it in some form or other. How are we going to leverage those benefits that I was talking about? Leverage that getting developers to quickly and easily deploy their code? 
So how many of you are developers? And how many of you have heard of Jenkins? A few of you. OK, Jenkins is what we call a, well, it's a testing tool, but it's, it's more commonly referred to nowadays as a continuous integration tool. Basically, if you have a, a process or a pipeline from developers write some code to needing to know if that code is good, to spinning that code up somewhere to test that it then actually works if it looks good, to having some tests run against it, see if the application performs the way it should, to then saying, yep, that developer made a good code change, that's fine. Um, Jenkins is a tool you can use to automate that pipeline. Um, it basically runs arbitrary commands of your choosing, be they test suites against kind of a code base, be they performance tests going out to an actual running copy of an application and uh, querying the APIs or querying the application to see what it's, if it's behaving properly. Jenkins is basically a tool for configuring a pipeline of tests and automating your code to development process. It is just an application, though. So you can run Jenkins on a pass and then use the copy of Jenkins you've spun up on a pass to actually automate the code development lifecycle of the applications you really want to host. So here you can see this is one instance of Jenkins with a random Jenkins-U8MQH name. Um, it's been given a DNS name, as all pass applications are when you deploy them, so it's instantly accessible. Um, and you can see the Jenkins web interface there. And I've just configured one example job. Um, doesn't do anything, but you would then start building up your process and defining jobs in there and what you want your development process to look like. And your development process could look something like this. So as I said, when you deploy an application on a pass, because you can't log into that container afterwards and kind of go, oh, I need to run a start command or I need to run, um, you know, install this binary or install this package. When you deploy an application with a pass, you give it some kind of, you give it a manifest. You pass a manifest, usually in the code base, to the pass when you say run this code. And that is basically saying, you know, dependencies, oh, I need, I need the Java JDK 1.7 something to be installed into this container as well. Um, I need you to run this start command. I need you to you know, do X, Y, and Z. I need you to connect me to this data service before you try and start this application. Um, those environment manifests are really, really useful because the pass surfaces a lot of those up into environment variables inside your container. So your application code can use them which means your application code, without changing the code, can be written to know which environment it's running in. It can know whether it's running in dev, or in test, or in perf, or in QA. Um, and so you can end up with something like this. You can end up with one set of application source. And then you have a production branch, which you know, is going to be locked down to maybe only a handful of people in your source control. Only a handful of people can push code to that, that production branch. And listening on that production branch, you have an instance of Jenkins running on the same pass that your code is running on. And every time there's an update to that production branch code, Jenkins is going to notice that because it's tied into hooks from the source control repository. Um, that's just one of the things Jenkins does out of the box. Jenkins can run all the tests that your developers have specified. Um, it could even spin up a demo copy just to make absolutely sure after testing. It could spin up a demo copy of the application not on your real production DNS name and run some more tests against it. And then it could do a blue-green deployment, a zero downtime deployment, by spinning up instances of the new copy of the application, removing the load balancer routes via the pass API from the old instances of the application, and then once those old instances of the application no longer had any connected clients, just destroy them. And then all you're left with is working instances of your new application. For developers, again, each development branch, you can spin up an instance of Jenkins. You might want to test, you know, you're not going to want to put tests into the production's Jenkins if those tests are testing something that only exists in a feature branch or a bug branch or a development branch. So you can rapidly enable developers to do the exact same development cycle as production by just creating a branch in their source control repo um, and having a Jenkins instance spun up on pass to listen to that repo. 
which is going to have all the same tests and configurations that are used to validate a production branch. They can then do proper end-to-end -end deployment testing of whatever changes they are making before it gets anywhere near production. And in fact, you can also have one Jenkins listening on your source control for new branches so that you have a Jenkins spinning up a Jenkins per branch, kind of, it's like Inception, right? We have many layers of Jenkins. Um, but the idea being, a new developer comes into your company, they want to make some code changes, they branch to work on a feature. Jenkins sees that new branch. It spins up a Jenkins specifically for that developer for that new branch, populated with all the tests of the production code train. Um, every time that developer then commits to that new branch, their copy of Jenkins is going to test that change against all the existing production um, tests. But also, because that's their copy of Jenkins and not touching production at all, um, they can add their own new tests in there to actually vet the tests, to actually vet their CI CD pipeline before doing anything to production. Okay? So, this is the kind of thing you can do really easily when the developers can self serve. Oh, I need, you know, Jenkins is just another application. If you don't want to use Jenkins, if you want to use Drone or one of the other many kind of testing uh, CI CD frameworks out there, you can. If you allow developers to self serve and deploy as many applications instances as they want without worrying about the underlying infrastructure, without having to configure VMs that they then have to maintain and update and remember about themselves. Um, you know, let them focus on their applications and you know, let them self-serve this. You know, I need 100 Jenkins because I have 100 different things I want to do. You know, crazy example, but that's fine. Just, just let them do it. Like, give them what they want. Let them get on with doing their job. So for those that do know Jenkins, how do you actually get Jenkins to do all that? How do you get it to actually deploy to Cloud Foundry? Um, there is a Jenkins Cloud Foundry plugin. I mean, it's not hard. You can also just use Jenkins exec commands to run the Cloud Foundry uh, CLI or just do direct curls to the API. But if you're lazy, like good developers should be, um, you're going to push, you know, you're going to use the plugin. The plugin allows you to configure your Cloud Foundry API. Um, it allows you to configure um, which space within the pass you want to deploy to. So you can keep within the pass, you can keep your production, your test, your you know, performance test, and your development branches completely separate. Even at the pass level, you can control who can spin up workloads in each based on user level security. And you can then use this Jenkins plugin to very simply have a push to Cloud Foundry step somewhere in your build pipeline. Or maybe twice. Push to Cloud Foundry in the dev environment, run some tests against the actual API to check that feature compatibility, you know, check for regressions in the actual APIs of my application. If that all passes, push to a perf environment and run my perf tests. For more info on this kind of stuff, um, MetaCloud in the DevNet booth have a OpenShift-based CI CD pipeline set up using Jenkins. The actual premise of using Jenkins, if you are not familiar, are very much the same. It's just the end deployment target is different. You're deploying into VMs instead of um, pass. But I definitely go and check them out. There is some um, coding stuff on the Learning Labs at learninglabs.cisco.com, which kind of covers you know, testing pipelines. Um, and there's also Project Shipped, which uses Drone, uh, which is a different tool to Jenkins, but again, an example of how you can automate the testing process. So a very quick slide on magic bullets. Um, and this is from my personal experience of working with ops teams and dev teams to try and help them with pass to enable them to develop quicker and get more value out of their teams. There are no magic bullets. Pass will not solve all the problems. You need to be wary of some of these because if you overpromise and underdeliver, even as good as the pass is, people are going to be annoyed, right? First impressions count. So a few words of warning. Data services. Um, as I said, some passes by default do not give you data services. You're expected to configure service brokers so that they integrate with your existing databases. Your databases, your Cassandras, your MAPARs, your HBase are all then stood up somewhere next to the pass. 
if you don't have any data services, and I made this mistake when I first deployed a pass for someone, if you don't have any data services set up out of the box and you ask developers to use it, it's amazing. They have an API. It works really well. They integrate it with Jenkins. They push their code, and they're like, this is great. Where's my data services? Like, how do I store like, user logins and sessions? And if you don't have those, they still have a load of manual work to do because you're automating the code process, but you still, you know, they're going to have to go, ah, oh, crap. Now I've got to talk to ops. I've got to find some VMs or some servers. I need some licenses for some databases. How do I then get the, the pass to talk to those? Because I don't know anything about the underlying of the pass because I just use this API. Yeah, data services. Make sure they're part of your pass strategy from the beginning. Otherwise, you're going to have some really unhappy people. Um, scale out and code base. I kind of touched on this already, but bad code is going to be just as bad on a pass as it is anywhere else. The only difference is you're probably going to notice it on a pass because of those pass rules, those pass enforcements, the, you, the developers coming up to you and going, how do I SSH into my container to install this RPM or this dependency? You don't. You might find, as we did, that moving applications to a pass surfaces things that people have been kind of doing in muscle memory without realizing it manually every time they deploy a new copy of an application without even making, you know, putting that in documentation. It's not written down anywhere. It's just something that that development team know isn't automated. So yeah, um, watch out for issues like that. You know, just because you can't SSH to the pass doesn't make the pass bad. It's, you might want to think about how the code's written and how you could get around not having that manual step in your process. Because realistically, if an instance of an application on pass dies at 4 a.m. The part, and you have like 12 of those instances load balanced, the pass is just going to spin another one up in its place. You want that. You don't want a text going to someone to manually run a, co a command that is needed to start a new instance of an application. But if you have a development team that is used to doing that and they suddenly can't do that, again, it's expectation setting, but watch out for it. Cattle not pets. I guess is what I'm trying to say there. Your application instances are not pets. They're not cute and cuddly. You don't you know, go, to, go and bury them and say a few prayers you know, when they pass away. If you wake up one morning and there are a 1,000 instances, and you wake up the next morning and there are a completely different 1,000 instances of your application, but the user still got uptime all the way through the night, that's fine. You shouldn't care. Um, obviously, if they're dying that quickly, you probably need to look at your code. But what I'm saying is you shouldn't care. You shouldn't go, oh, I really liked instance I296432B. He was my friend. I did some coding on him manually via SSH. Don't do that. Um, another thing, development, there's this website called the 12-factor app. It's how to write apps that will fit really well in a um, kind of well, in a cloud scalable environment, how to kind of keep items decoupled, how to not depend on things, how to not cause depend, uh, cascading failures. It's a, just a really good kind of 12 guidelines to ensure you're writing good code. And one thing I will say is that doesn't necessarily mean you need to write microservices. Everyone's like, oh, if you're writing good code nowadays, you need to write microservices. Microservices take time. They are hard. If you're developing a product against like a timeline to get to market, you can write a well-designed monolith and worry about scaling it out to microservices when you have customers, when you have money, when you have traction. Um, following the 12-factor app, even if you're writing a monolith, will make taking that monolith and making it into microservices later easier. And I know I'm very, very short on time, so just a quick slide on pass innovation. Um, Cisco are doing some really cool stuff in the open source world. And obviously, the past products that we are planning to host will benefit from this innovation. Um, areas like networking, security, policy, automation, um, integration with existing tools and policy like ACI and our products, um, we are actively working on these. The best examples of those are at Cisco Cloud GitHub repo. 
uh, where you can see some of the open source work we're doing. And also there's a V brown bag talk I did yesterday on the work we're doing to make container networking more scalable, more high performance, and support more network types. You know, not just HTTP, HTTPS applications, but how we start supporting richer applications within platform as a service. Roadmap, I've already kind of covered. Um, we're planning on offering passes fully managed and integrated from Cisco Cloud. Um, we are also doing work, as I said, um, on improving kind of the networking stacks within, um, within Docker and within some of the underlying container layers so that we can support richer applications and support kind of back-end services instead of just kind of front-end applications. Um, and we're also doing work to ensure that Pass applications are a first-class citizen of InterCloud. So the whole, this whole talk has been about kind of, look, people don't care about VMs anymore, right? They're, they're not exciting. Like, people just want to be able to get on and deploy the code. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't be looking at Pass. Um, it doesn't make sense for InterCloud to be all about, oh, well, I can move VMs, I can port VMs. So we're working on making sure that containers are treated as containers within our InterCloud model. And as InterCloud grows out and scales to more and more service providers, and you're able to transparently utilize and move those workloads between service providers, we want to make sure that you're able to do that in units of pass containers as well as full fat VMs. And we only have about five minutes left, so I kind of rushed through that bit because I'm wondering if there's any questions. That's excellent. I'm okay with that. That could be one of two things. It's either good or bad. I don't know. Yes. Oh, you didn't have your. <laughs> I'll come over here. Sorry. Ah, there we go. So, what, what kind of infrastructure are you guys using behind the ship? Behind shipped. Yeah. Um, <laughs> good question. Um, shipped is actually running on Mesos and Marathon. Um, and it doesn't provide currently all of the, as I say, developer self-service tools like the logging and the aggregation and things that one of the fuller OpenShift or Cloud Foundry platforms does. The reason, that, well, Shipped actually can deploy Docker containers down onto any pass with an API that takes Docker containers. It is currently deploying down onto microservices infrastructure, which is an open source project utilizing Mesos and Marathon. The reason we're using that is all of kind of our hacking and tinkering and kind of innovating on, you know, Docker networking and, and that kind of stack. Um, we're doing in microservices infrastructure in the open source project. And for licensing and complexity and, you know, getting to the bare bits of components reasons, um, it's easier to do that on something smaller and more contained like Mesos at, than at the moment than it is diving into what is already a very well-established kind of large Cloud Foundry code base. Thank you. No worries. Anyone else? Awesome. I hope someone learned something. That, that would be great. Um, what else do we have here? Ah, complete online session evaluation. Um, this is the first talk I have ever done at Cisco Live. Um, so negative or positive, as long as it's kind of, you know, keep the bad language to a minimum and be reasonably constructive. I really would appreciate any feedback, even if it's not great. Um, complete the session surveys. You can do it on the mobile app or at ciscolive.com slash online. Um, and then if this stuff has interested you, kind of continue your application. Like I said, there's some really cool people um, talking about CI, CD, talking about kind of containers and platforms in this area right behind you. Um, Definitely go and talk to those guys. Um, there are some cloud techs in the Meet the Engineer sessions if you want to talk cloud further. Um, and there's also a lot of cloud sessions going on in the wider Cisco Live. So um, yeah, have a gander and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference, guys.